Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My dissertation work has already involved the world of participatory culture. And back then I had a title with Master of Culture, of the different groups coming together, landing together. And and we'll see that uh, it is actually a very intertwined uh, world we're dealing with. It. So this workshop is titled Potential Practice Policy, and my talk goes along those lines, but I start with a rhetoric, the potential of technology in the response. Um, yesterday, Time magazine nominated the person of the year, and it's this year it's the protester. I don't know whether you have seen the title already. I haven't seen it uh, uh, apart from seeing it online. There has been another title a few years back when the person of the year was you, the user, everybody of us. And both towers are actually related. They are related to the technology or more appropriately to the ideological connotation of technology. And that is something we're going to talk about first. It is that... Yes, that's good. If we speak of technology, we, we actually dream of a society. So every time a technology is produced, the inventor has ideas about future uses of the technology. Very often, utopias tend to be engines of ingenuity and sparkle the interest of the developers to provide the technology for creating a better future. The other way around, users are also inspired by technology. They see a technology, they use the technology, and they think I can put it to several uses that were not possible yesterday or before the invention of this technology. So a technology bears a promise, and if we go back in history, we've seen that repeatedly. The telegraph has been presented at its time as uh, creating a world as a socialist dream. Everything would be free for sharing. That was the, the rhetorical connotation of the telegraph back then. And uh, the radio, a similar dream of a global village where everybody could be connected to everybody else. And with the information technology, it went even further. A very interesting moment in information technology is that the computer pioneers of the 60s actually come from the counterculture of the United States. And they recognize their own values and their own dreams in the technology. And that is why it is so important that we try to deconstruct the ideological connotation and look behind it. And that is something we're dealing with at the moment. In the 90s, in the early 90s, the technologies to come, the information technologies to come, have presented as the information superhighway. And it was most prominently Bill Clinton, who spoke of a rosy future where the new information technologies, the new information highways, as he called, would connect people from disadvantaged locations to the markets of the first world, people who were in geographically not so favorable positions could access the knowledge that they needed. So in the 90s, the discourse emphasized mostly the access to technology, the access to the resources. That was the main trope that has been used there. The technology was shaped around it. If we go back and we look at the old Cisco advertisements of the 90s, we see that access is always the point they're emphasizing that you need access, and if you do not lose the access, you will be the one who will stay behind, you will fall behind, you won't have access to knowledge, you won't have access to the prospering market. But there has been a change. With the advent of the best to all, the rhetoric changed a bit. And now we dream of participation and collaboration. On the one hand, because in the Western societies, we have a diffusion of access that is really wide. It is not that we differentiate the digital divide in Western uh, in industrial nations uh, through the terms of having access or having not access, but rather from what are you doing when you are having access. 
This changes a lot, and the new technologies, the new applications that we're using in the so-called Web 2.0, I'm not a, 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 this is not a favorite word for me, Web 2.0, social web, so and that's why I call it this so-called Web 2.0, this so-called social web. We see an emphasis on participation and collaboration, and collaboration. And that becomes most clearly visible in the use of two words, the social and the community. The technologies, the so-called social web, is framed as social in a way that it is positive. So we get the feeling that social means friendly people are working together and create nice things in a really cozy community. So we get a really one-sided picture of social and we forget that the sociologists <coughs> define the social simply as what humans do with humans. That could be also very nasty things. But in the Web 2.0, in the glossy world of the Web 2.0 interfaces, the social is always friendly and it gives the users the feeling that they are together in a big story, that they work together with other users and the other users are always my friend. And I can make them my friends, I can friend them, I can follow them. And if I don't like them, I unfriend them and I don't see them ever again. So it is a really nice and cozy world that is presented here. So mostly the activities of the users have been described as be, becoming content providers, creating content. So the narrative when that the user formally, some, some scholars actually formulated them. That the user formally known as audience, as if there was no audience anymore, this of course completely wrong, um, is now producing their own media content and not a media corporation. We all know, everybody here, that's a tool. For what? The participation is in relative figures, rather small. Always a small group is contributing to the largest percentage of any content of on any platform. On Wikipedia, there was a research done on Wikipedia. The majority of all edits on Wikipedia has been made by 2% of the users. So it's a really small fraction of the entire community creating the majority of the content. Which I do not say to diminish their work, but which I say to put a more a nuance on the idea that every user has become a producer. So for mostly, and that was the cover uh, from, from 2007, uh, the, the user becomes a media producer, a creator. And the media industry is actually undergoing a shift, going away from their core business of producing media content and emerging as a new industry, providing platforms where users are creating content or engaged in social interaction. The second aspect of participation became really, in a mainstream way, visible with the so-called Arab Spring. And some authors of the so-called techno-optimists, but actually I can just uh, to let the so-called the way of the techno-optimists, actually think that those technologies might change the world to the better. I have inserted a reminder that that is also a moment of deja vu, because we see that with every technology. So in, in the 50s, when there was a big Cold War going on, McLuhan stated, we can, we can win China and India for the rest only by giving them the new media, at the time, radio and television. Russia will not give these to them. So now we have such a deja vu moment again. We see a new technology and we think, wow, that technology is going to solve our problems. We download the democracy app and we will have democracy throughout the Middle East. And that is the way we've seen the Arab Spring. And that is really good until the research done that Twitter has played an important role in distributing messages. Of course, I'm not going to deny that. But I find it interesting how especially Western media started to celebrate their own technologies. And if, if you take a closer look on that, you see something that is really pressing to think very much about That is the ambivalence of those new media and the ambivalence in the political discourse. See, on the one hand, politicians embracing the use of social media in the Middle East. You see uh, the political administration of the United States urging Twitter to delay 
an important update so that their services would be available for people in Iran and Tehran for mostly. Where a political administration engages in the policies of a company in order to do something that is in a way, way related to their foreign policies. On the other hand, we see Hillary Clinton calling for a policy of internet freedom, mostly used to bash uh, uh, the, the foreign policy competitor of China and the use of the internet over there, and simultaneously doing everything to have WikiLeaks shut down. So we see a really strange situation with our policy makers and our political leaders. And that goes on. Earlier this week, Nini Cruz did something very important. She, she called for an open data strategy. It is important. There are a lot of questions to ask later, but that is a good start. On the same day, she also called for a no disconnect strategy, which is really good to think about uh, a policy against repressive countries that try to, to prevent their citizens to access information technology. But she discredited her own strategy severely by appointing uh, uh, Mr. Zu Guttenberg as the ambassador. Since he is, I'm not talking about his fake information, uh, I'm not talking about that he has been exposed by the power of the web as an imposter, I'm speaking about the fact that he is a known supporter of internet filtering. So how could this person possibly be credible for fighting for a no disconnect strategy if he's actually from a political administration that is in strong favor of data retention and internet filtering. And who's also married to a woman who is pushing for an internet filter strategy uh, in her own agenda. And we can go on, the German administration was engaging in weapon deals with Saudi Arabia and we know who was crushing the democracy movement in Bahrain. So we see this, this dance politicians at the moment have, on the one hand, embracing the new technology that we needed, but we needed a way that we can still control it. And that is a big problem. What is participation in this? Participation became mostly a legend. It's a legend that describes the new media. It is the ideological connotation saying, these technologies allow you to participate. And we'll speak in a minute about companies who are really smart in the way to make their users participate on their terms, not on their users, on their own terms. So participation is, is a label, a very important label. And that's why it's so important that we think about practices. So we put participation into practice in a rapid way from the rhetoric, from the near rhetoric of participation. What I dislike in the scholarly world, that's the world I come from, about this participation rhetoric is that it tells a very short story where a passive, a so-called passive consumer, is evolving through the stage of a critical reader to a user to finally become a producer. And we will speak about that now uh, a bit uh, more in detail. So in my research, I tried to define what are these people actually doing online. And I'll, I'll point it out to you. I have these three domains here. I call them accumulation, archiving, and construction. The imperative of accumulation is remixing, taking media content that has been earlier produced by the established media industry and changing it in a bit. That might be a remix song, that might be remixing a video, might be Photoshop art. The biggest label we know online for this world would be fan culture. Think of Harry Potter and how Harry Potter is changed in Photoshop art by the fans, how the storyline is changed, how fans engage in changing <coughs> topics or items for popular culture they like and put it and add their personal twist to it. That is what I call accumulation. Then we have archiving. It's everything what has to do with organizing data online. Think of Wikipedia. That would be firmly in the center of the archiving uh, sector. Um, think of archive.org, the biggest archive online. The construction is where new things are created beyond the established channels of the cultural industry. Think of the cultural industry is here. So what we can see here is an extension of the cultural industry into the domain of the users. And the gray overlay 
here is the area that the digital millennium copyright act comes into play. Because archiving or sponging content online is also P2P file sharing. But most of the data in P2P file sharing systems actually comes from the accumulation domain, formerly produced by the established media industry. So we have here a conflict of law, and this is where we have the cultural benefit. And on the dynamics of those cultural benefits, I'll speak later. Uh, same is here in the construction area, where we have hackers Hacking, for instance, the Xbox. That was one of my cases. Hacking the Xbox has been first rendered illegal, and Microsoft tried to stop it. In the end, Microsoft actually benefited big time from it because they learned a lot from what the users did and incorporated most of it in the newer version of the Xbox. Anyway, so these are areas where actually participation of users takes place. And it takes place because of the new technologies we have. And that is something that is really difficult to learn for companies. It has to do with the computer as a universal machine. It has to do with software as a really modular and tentative entity that can be changed. The software piece can be useful for the complete opposite that the original designer designed it for. And the internet as a combining, a connecting entity where the many users, the many universal machines are connected. That change, distribution for good, think of Napster, that change collaboration for good. There are industries that have a real hard time to get that. The music industry and the film industry have prominently shown over the 15 years of the past 15 years that they were not able to get to the, I call this the weather question. So you can either accept that we live in a digital summer and put out your Aloha shirt, as most of the younger people do. <coughs> Or you can try to put air conditioning machines everywhere, what film and music industry are trying to do, to keep it as cold as possible so they can firmly stay back in their industrial age. There are three dynamics revolving out of this basic situation that we have a change media specific situation. New media, that is something it's like a new reality, just adapt to it. So think about it, adapt to it. That's the industry that is really going to have a hard time about that is the publishing industry. You can see them keeping already lots of the mistakes the music and film industry already did. So there are three dynamics that might be consequences for, that I identify as consequences of this new situation and how you can address it. It's confrontation, it's integration, and it's implementation. Confrontation is what we've seen in the music and film industry. The idea of turning the situation back not changing your business model, the business model of the music and film industry is deeply flawed because it never was about a piece of music or a film, it was always about the distribution of that container that has been filled with whatever. You can see that clearly that the music and film the music industry is really unwilling to pay musicians for online content. So even sold downloads are not compensated to the musicians. And that is in the contract of the music industry, the old fashioned music industry. So confrontation is one way. We can see <coughs> the effects of the confrontation in uh, the battle against file sharing, in uh, laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the ACTA agreement, which is at the moment at the Fisher, the Fisher Council and uh, probably being adopted today. And uh, the people adopting it haven't read it actually and are not aware of its contents. And the entity we are signing it with is uh, the United States, is not liable and not binded to the agreement. It's only those other countries signing it. The other possibility is integration. It's really interesting to see how Google Maps tackled their problem of having an application that was more or less the same as Yahoo was provided. And Yahoo was actually in the beginning superior to the mouth of Google. But Google designed a new strategy and said, we have a community out there of developers that make use of our application. Not in the idea of a community of enthusiastic fans. No, a community of people who say, this is a good application, I can use it for my own work, for my own business, or for my personal interest whatsoever. So Google opened the interfaces as far as possible and said, Take the data, take the software application, and work with us in changing it so you can suit it to your personal needs and help us improving the application. 
they did not only stick to opening it, they provided spaces. They have the uh, have a dates, they organize coding dates where all the coders from the world can meet and can engage with each other. So the community gets a space where they can get together. And that helped Google to improve their own application tremendously. The game industry is doing that since a long time. The game industry wouldn't be successful without this attitude, giving the users as, far, as, as many possibilities to change and to tweak the games and then incorporate it again in their own business. Another thing Google did was, whenever someone was changing their application in the way that wasn't good for Google, and think of Google Maps, Google doesn't have the copyrights for most of the things in Google Maps. The, the geographical data are uh, licensed by, by a third party, and so are the areas of the So they did not say the cease and desist there, which is the common communication for, for music and film industry. They sent a fellow programmer saying, hey, I really dig what you're doing over there, but I actually have a small problem, and you might rethink your changes in our application programming interface. So maybe you can take <coughs> back or stop distributing it in the way you did. That was just a change of tone, not a change of power structure, not at all. But as we say in, in German, the tone macht die Musik. If you say it nicely, it is better received by, by the other side. Implementation, which is uh, what I'm researching, is far more interesting and, and far more <laughs> tricky and far more powerful actually. That is what Facebook and Co. are doing. That is what the social media, the so-called social media are doing. So in the center where we have uh, uh, the, the traditional media industry, we have now a new emerging media industry, uh, which is MySpace. I like to call MySpace because it gives an idea that you can also have a speed line if you have been one of the most powerful social media sites at your time. So that can change. Facebook, LinkedIn, LinkedIn at the moment, uh, uh, after the IPO of LinkedIn, uh, a totally overrated company. Uh, Mega Upload, Rapid Share, YouTube. These are companies who were really smart in implementing user activities that have been developed over the past 15 years online. So for all these applications, we had activities. Nothing is new what they offer. What they offer is a new interface for unskilled users to provide media content, to share media content, and to engage in social interaction. So they can reach out to completely new user groups. And that is what we've seen lately. That Twitter is easy to use, uh, Facebook is easy to use. But on the one hand, we have the glossy interface the user is using. That is a technology. And as Finger reminds us, technological design is the key to cultural power. And that power is severely used in the social media applications. The user activities, almost all user activities, are severely channeled through the interface design. Think of Facebook. You have a like button there. You don't have a dislike button. And there's a good reason for it. Because the dislike button is something that is not so favorable for advertisers. And Facebook is foremostly a platform that must be attractive for advertisers. That's the reason why Facebook is offering even less than the ancient Rome did in its most decadent time, when the visitors of the Circus Maximus could decide to live or die and have a dislike button. So another point is that the user-generated content, or the so-called user-generated content, is actually monitored. There are many people in the behind the interface that are monitoring what users are uploading. And the users are part of it as well. And software is part of it as well. YouTube is automatically filtering every video for um, it's comparing it to digital waterprints of music files to see whether you're using copyrighted music. And there are immunity filters uh, used in YouTube and there is the flag button so users can also participate in uh, removing content. So if we speak of user-generated content, we should, be, we should be reminded that this content is moderated, evaluated, and monitored. And with social media, we have a new industry rising. That is the social media analytics industry. That is actually in real time tracking how people speak about a company on Twitter. And think of that. That is only marketing. But 
think of the surveillance technology that is sold to repressive countries all over the world, mostly by, by the Western nations, that is doing the same, in real time filtering what you are saying. And then it's not about a soft drink or a fashion brand, but then it's about democracy that will be filtered out. So we need to be aware of the back-end politics, as I call it, the platform politics that is shaping user activities and actually shaping the way they express on these platforms. And I will later then turn to why these platforms are so popular among the politicians at the moment. But first, to Mark Zuckerberg, a really young and, and successful CEO of the company. Last year, he addressed his, at the time, uh, close to 500 million users in a video. And as you can see, he's sitting there in an almost statesman-like position. It's like a presidential uh, 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 address note he's giving here. And he's addressing his users and asking them to participate in a vote. In a vote on the documents that should govern Facebook. What Facebook is asking their users to think about the documents to govern Facebook? That sounds strange. But it isn't. They actually put up an entire platform, the so-called government site on Facebook, and ask the users to comment on the documents. They have written up the documents themselves. And they made a vote. People were asked to vote. There's no explanation how many people have to vote uh, when Facebook would, uh, would have to uh, accept the vote as binding, and uh, how you register for voting and so forth. That is pretty much open, but there is a rhetoric of hey, We really appreciate your input that please participate in. And the video was there in, in all languages or in the majority of languages that are used on Facebook. On the other hand, we see this. Users posting a bill of rights. So the consumers of those Facebook applications turn into something that we could call citizens. And actually, as we have seen in the so-called Arab Spring, the social media turn into something that we could call public space. Although it is not public at all, it is private and it is uh, governed by a corporation. But we engage in activities that we traditionally used in public space. So there is something changing in those platforms, and that is why we have to think about it. On the other hand, those platforms are inspiring the offline world, the politicians that think, oh, we cannot ignore those platforms any longer. And you see uh, Barack Obama visiting Facebook for a town hall meeting. I find that really interesting that a traditional democratic activity as a town hall meeting all of a sudden takes place in the headquarters of Facebook. And then the EG8 organized uh, in France earlier this year where Zuckerberg again and Google and Vivendi and eBay, all the big industry leaders of the internet uh, culture have been invited for the discussion face-to-face -face discussion with the political leaders, the civil society was excluded, of course. Only the industry leaders were present. So something is going on here. We see that these platforms turn into something that becomes, that extends our public space. Where civic action is conducted. But it is governed by corporation, and it is used by political leaders to shape policies. I don't find that really a coincidence. I mean, that's a political image that we all know of uh, politics. And we see the dilemma of politics at the moment that is most often addressed as the double speak. On one hand, you embrace the internet. On the other hand, you try to control it. And we, we can see that even in important initiatives, as the open data initiative, which is great, but which uh, raises questions as how do you maintain the data? How do you create the standards so you can actually synchronize data from the various platforms, countries, and so forth? How do we develop the talent of people that can actually work with those data? And furthermore, how do we prevent that those data do not become a data cemetery? So you have to maintain it. The idea that it is really cheap and you open it and you just offer a technological solution is a bit short-sighted. You have to go a step further. Uh, I don't want to criticize at all Nidhi um, Kuz's agenda here. I think it's really important what they are doing with the Open Data Initiative. I just say it is not solved now. Open data is at the moment a buzzword that is used by many politicians and many administrations. Many cities are open, opening their data. But you have to ask further, who's going to maintain those data? How can we work with those data? How can we make sense of those data? So 
So I asked my students after the transparency hype <coughs> of this week to randomly download data from Wikileaks and make something to see how many software applications you need to read through the 4,000 pages of the interrogation files, how many activities you need to conduct and how many programming work to make the 500,000 page of messages of 9-11 readable. Half of it is written by machines, so uh, it's not easy to read. We really need to speak about literacies if we speak about the use of new media. And if we speak about policies, about the right and the legal framework to use and reuse data and to establish a cultural resource that is actually accessible and won't be used for commercial purposes, or won't be taken away. You see at the moment how companies uh, try to, to use public domain books and resell them, or the Wikipedia <coughs> books that you can find in, in many publishing houses, but they just rip off Wikipedia, print it as a book, and their library is actually buying those books, unfortunately. So there is a business model behind that. I quote from a, from a study, uh, I, I was a respondent to that study, it was a big study uh, uh, for the um, digital competitiveness uh, report of the digital agenda of the EU, and it was called the social impact of ICT, and one of the co-researchers summarized participation as the main motive for governments and public administration to start experimenting with participation is to close the gap that is perceived to be growing between governments and its citizens. And, and that's the most important point, and to boost the legitimacy of government policy and administration decisions. So we see that the interest of the government is totally aligned with the interest of Facebook in calling for a vote. It is more about the label of participation, of the rhetoric of participation, <coughs> instead of offering real participation. So, to wrap up my talk, I like to, to refer to an old Chinese saying that goes, when the wind of change is blowing, some are building shelters, some are building windmills. So let's consider ACTA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, SOPA, or Adobe, the shelters industrial age that we have to carry around in the digital age. And think of integration and implementation of the digital age. And think about the problems that integration and implementation bring and put forward to shape a valuable resource for citizens and users to connect and to engage in cultural activities, to provide the cultural freedom that is not channeled, channeled by interfaces or not mainly channeled by interfaces that others are doing, but that allow the possibility to express your cultural freedom and to find platforms that maybe are public, are really public, public platforms. I don't know, maybe that is the idea. Um, I think that a concerted effort is necess necessary to whip our cultural agenda out of this double speak that is at the moment going on on the political agenda. I think that is the biggest threat to the online culture at the moment, that it becomes so attractive for the wrong person, for big corporations and politicians that think that this is a way to have a so-called e-government and a so-called participation. But actually this is the best resource we ever have, a resource that is providing so much ingenuity and uh, uh, innovation that we should protect it and should fight for policies that really create a sustainable online culture. Thank you.